Switching our attention to the Australian Open and to do that I'm delighted to say we're joined on the line by Catherine Murphy live from Melbourne. Catherine, it is an inevitable procession for Novak Djokovic, isn't it? Surely at this stage? It really feels that way. Hello to you, Jer. He was so dominant against the Australian Alex de Menor. I have never witnessed domination like that on a tennis court. I feel a little bit vindicated, Jura, because in his post-match interview, he said something that I thought, there's my evidence. For a few years, I have felt like Novak Djokovic is at such a high level that sometimes he drops a set. And I'm convinced he has decided to do that. I'm convinced that sometimes he's thinking, you know, I haven't had enough matches in build-up events. I'd like a four-setter for my fitness or maybe, Jura, it's because he's just at such a high level, he gets a bit bored with the opposition, he becomes complacent, he drops a set. In that win over Alex Demonor, he spoke to Jim Courier on court after, who is such a good post-match interviewer. And Jim Courier said to him, I'm not going to ask you how you beat Alex Dimonor, but I'm going to ask why in front of a packed Aussie crowd who wanted a long night at the tennis. Like, these are crowds that have got used to staying up for Andy Murray till 4 a.m. Why are we all on our way home? Why'd you beat him that way? And he said, because I wanted to. And it was chilling the way he said it. And he finished the interview with a massive warning to his opponent tonight, Andre Rublev. He said... You know, playing against Andre Rublev will be similar. They're similar players with similar styles. So I hope the result's the same. It was so chilling. It was like, I'm going to win this. Oh, and he also said the words, I don't want to celebrate too early, as if there was an option juror at the Australian Open that the rest of the draw can go, actually, do you want to give them the trophy now? We'll keep playing for ranking points and prize money, but we all know the outcome. I've never seen a situation at the Australian Open where we feel like we know the winner and the countdown is on to his trophy presentation, but you never know, and that's the great thing about sport. There's a there's a bit of a siege mentality, isn't there, Catherine, around Novak Djokovic at this tournament? Like he even referenced, you know, the narrative around his injuries. I think at this tournament, which has clearly irked him a little bit. Shane, you're totally right. Now, the complicated part of those comments is that he made those comments in a Serbian media gathering with print journalists that we weren't party to. So we didn't get any of those quotes in English. And it's caused a bit of a stir because reportedly he told Serbian media that, you know, he feels like when other people have injuries, and I presume he's referring to Rafael Nadal, they're the victim. When he has an injury, he's faking it. Now, there were questions, audible questions, in the media seats at Rod Laver Arena when he started to destroy Alex Demonor. Because we're like, I'm sorry, he can't have a hamstring injury. And again, a great question by Jim Courier led him to say, I didn't feel any pain today. Then he went to that Serbian press gathering where he made those comments. He also reportedly made comments about Alex Demonor saying, we don't have a relationship. Now, a year ago, Alex Demonor was like a lot of players, and I believe he said something to the effect that, well, you have to be vaccinated to play here. Now, I'm not so sure that he uttered words that would suggest he's in some sort of feud with Alex Demono, and some of the papers ran with that. And as you know, guys, that's the great thing about off the ball, and it's the great thing about TV. You can't take people out of context because you hear the tone in what they're saying, which you don't in print, which can make it dangerous. But it caused a lot of headlines. It upset Alex Demonor, who then tweeted saying, why did the media always have to make a controversy and a headline out of everything? I was outclassed and outplayed. So I felt for Alex Demonor that he was upset by some of the coverage. But it's never dull. That's one thing, that's for sure, with Novak. No, we're 10 minutes away from the uh, the start of his uh, next match. I, I do want to just point out one thing. We were talking about Breakpoint, the new Netflix um, series on the show last week. Every single one of them, 
Every single one of them who took part in it, dead this week. Gone. No thanks. It's like... That is true. And can I... This is an important point you raised because I was really triggered yesterday. I saw that Johnny Sexton was asked about the upcoming Netflix coverage of the Six Nations. And I was like, Johnny, you run so far away from that because you don't need to be injured or out of the World Cup. Please, guys, can you start a campaign to let Johnny Sexton know about the Netflix curse? Yeah. Because we don't want... Johnny Sexton having any part of any Netflix curse ahead of the World Cup. And if Netflix are following the Six Nations, can I trust you two to sort that out for me? I was really concerned when I saw that. Having said that, it's good information to have now because we can just send them into. I mean, if they can only follow the All Blacks uh, for the rest of the year, we'd be happy enough with that. Oh, that'd be so good. Follow the All Blacks. And what about Eddie Jones? Look, we could talk for an hour about rugby, but Eddie Jones is already getting such publicity over here for rugby in Australia. And rugby has really been struggling. He has been on 7.30, one of the highest profile current affairs shows. It's like he's gone on prime time over here to explain why he's back in Australia. And I saw that on BBC Five Live, he was talking about Owen Farrell getting a hard time of English fans and Owen Farrell really gristling at the mention of Eddie. And Eddie, to me, is just sounding like all my dreams have come true in rugby. I mean, he's over in Australia raising the profile of rugby while irking the English rugby players. I mean, it's going to be... It's funny already. It's already funny to watch. He's like Prince Harry. He's doing all the the media rounds, getting them done. Yeah, and it's brilliant because rugby has really struggled. And that was such a big story that on the first day of the Australian Open, I moved my sports bulletins out to the Australian Open and I ran with rugby first. And that's unheard of. That's the Eddie effect. Wow, that is interesting because we we talked to Matt Williams a good bit about how the game uh, needed something and, and maybe the Messiah figure uh, of Eddie Jones is going to fix that. Can, just to, to wrap up on the tennis, um, the the women's semi-finals at this stage, it's very difficult to pick a winner from that. Um, what do you think is going to happen there? I think that Elena Rybakina has been so outstanding and I think she's very motivated because she's a reigning Wimbledon champion that just manages to creep under the radar. She isn't even scheduled in the high-profile matches despite she's the reigning Wimbledon champion. Now, I think there's a reason for that, Jura, because when she won Wimbledon, of course, Russian and Belarusian players had been banned from the tournament and she was born in Moscow but changed her affiliation to Kazakhstan a number of years ago. But she was in a tough position at that tournament of almost I felt like she didn't want to talk about herself. She didn't want her story to be known and she even had to face questions about that when she won. So she's just gone under the radar. She's been so impressive here. It's so open though. Arena Sabalenka She has been so impressive. Now, 12 months ago in Australia, Arena Sabalenka could barely serve. She had massive serving yips. Everyone was talking about it. In fact, they're still asking her about it because the turnaround has been so great. She won a tournament in the build-up to the Australian Open in Adelaide, and she looks in amazing form. And we've always known she has the game to win a Grand Slam, but she struggled mentally with those serving yips but it looks like it's all coming together for her. So Rybakina as a rank, I think Rybakina is going through to the final and I'd be backing Sabalenka, even though Magdalenette being in the final four, she's 30 from Poland and she's into a semi-final of a Grand Slam. She's never even been past the third round at a Grand Slam before and she is not the Polish player we thought we'd be talking about. We thought it would be all about the world number one, Iga Świątek. So it's been really surprising. I will say one thing about women's tennis right now. I miss the Williams sisters. They had a star power that they brought to events, like a vibe. Like when the Williams are in the house, 
things are different. Just like when the big three are in the house, we're down to the big one with Rafa's departure. And there's a different vibe, you know, when you don't have those, and particularly Serena, an icon of the sport is missing and that star power is gone. So what I'd really love to see in women's tennis, because Ash Barty, she won a Grand Slam on three different surfaces. So a surface slam, then retires after the Australian Open. Tennis needs a superstar, like an Emma Raducanu or a Coco Goff. I would have loved to see them go further into the draw, Jura and Shane, just because they have that bit of star power about them and that's a little bit missing this year all right Catherine, great to have you with us as ever thanks a million for making the time for us cheers thank you Jura and Shane that's uh, Catherine Murphy on the line from Australia this morning at the Australian Open in Melbourne